Hey Internet, I'm Chaz. And I'm Dan. Welcome to Wine and Serious Business, episode 206. We've got a special guest up here tonight, all the way from California. Rachel Ryan is visiting your sommelier for... I am currently unemployed right now. Oh. <laughs> we'll just try that one more time. <laughs> we're telling restaurant stories. I thought you were, uh, thought you were with I somebody. I quit to Harvest. Oh, yeah. wow. Well, that's... I'm going to keep that, actually. That's yes. really good. You quit... <laughs> A former sommelier who yeah. decided to throw it all away in order to work the harvest. That's fantastic. Awesome. And how did you get connected? So, so we're hanging. Maybe you recognize the set. Some of you experts who watch a long time. <laughs> uh, we're hanging out uh, with Barnaby and Olga tonight. Tonight, and uh, they're off camera, getting some off camera pours. Maybe some, maybe some comments, off camera comments. Um, so, so how did you get connected with them? Well, um, this is sort of the, the tail end of my harvest. I've already spent about five, six weeks in Anderson Valley, California, okay. working for a winery called Kinez, which is, um, so Anderson Valley up in Mendocino County of California, mm -hmm. and had a really great experience and was really sad when it was over because California is really warm and really sunny, and it was fantastic, but we wrapped things up, and then the winemaker said, why don't you go to Oregon? I, I think I can set something up for you. So uh, the distributor that we use for the winery in California is the same winery that Olga and Barnaby use um, for their wines in California. So cool. Want to give them a shout out? Who is that? So it's Rebel Wines ah, in California. Right. Um, and they do, a, they're a, a pretty small distributor, but they do an amazing job of representing small brands, really um, sort of what we're, I think what we're going to talk about today is kind of the new wave of not just California wines, but Oregon wines. So really small a lot of family-owned wineries just making really hands-on cool climate wines. Cool. And uh, yeah, and th these are wines that have kind of come together, uh, I guess for a little while, like you, you guys have had these, right? Yep. And, and, and Barbie and Olga were both telling us like, man, we've had these great wines out of California. You really need to come check them out. That's right. Um, and, and we're excited to be able to taste them today with somebody who knows a little bit about them. Um, at least two. So, so what's what's the first one that we're starting with here? So, um, so this is the first wine of the day. This is a California Chardonnay, which shouldn't scare you off because a lot of times people think California Chardonnay is going to be like really big and really fat and really oaky. But this is Matthiasen, uh, 2012 Napa Valley from the Linda Vista Vineyard. Um, so, if you're talking Chardonnay in California, you're really talking Napa Valley. Like that is the classic area for Chardonnay. And what's interesting, actually, is that most of it has been ripped out. So typically now sure. you see more Cabernet, um, mostly Cabernet, but like Merlot, Petit Verdot, because it's more profitable than Chardonnay. Right, right. Tear the white wines out. Chardonnay, Chardonnay is, Chardonnay is, Chardonnay is just pretty like old school for right? California. Yeah. But still, when you say to someone, oh, I'm having a Napa Valley Chardonnay, they're thinking it's going to be super high in alcohol, super oaky, super buttery. Um, who's, the icon what, who's the iconic Chardonnay for that? Who's like the cliche Napa Chardonnay? If you're saying like what's the iconic, or what's the the cliche? We'll say I'd the say cliche, not iconic. Let's, let's go with cliche. Fantastic. Yeah, that, that's yeah, the one yeah. we use. <laughs> that's the one we use for that example. So. Yeah, yeah, Bauer, yeah, AKA yeah. Cougar Juice. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Barbie's favorite uh, favorite video <laughs> prop as well. So. Um, there are a few other wineries though, like yeah. Stony Hill. That's sure. definitely, you know, Stony Hill. Um, I don't know who else, but yeah, just just really oaky, yeah. really buttery, really rich style, high alcohol Chardonnay. And what's interesting is that this is a winery that they don't really own any of their own vines right now. They've planted sure. some at their house, um, but this is still in Napa Valley, and it's, it's interesting to me because it's an expression that you can actually plant vines and grow fruit and make wine in an area that's considered really warm climate, really rich, really buttery, totally. and do it in a really restrained style. Yeah, we did a pre-tasting of this and both of us were shocked. We were like, this is Napa fruit? Like, no way. And we don't know right. much about California, but that association she was talking about is still very much in our brains. Yeah. So. So I should also say it's from the Oak Knoll oh, District. So oh, okay. this is actually where they live. Um, so Matthiasen is Steve and Jill Matthiasen. A really, really lovely couple. Um, I've been out to their house. Um, they're just super chill, super laid back, really, really lovely people. Um, and they're mainly still purchasing fruit from other sites within Napa. And they're slowly building up some parcels around their property. And this is actually called the Linda Visa Chardonnay, because that's the street they live on. It's like oh, Linda cool. Visa Road or Linda Visa Drive or whatever. So the parcel is across the street um, from their house. Um, so Oak Knoll is at the southern end of Napa. Napa's broken up into, I should probably know this, but it's like 16 or 17 sub-APAs. 
Um, and Okinola is. Wow, I didn't know that until just now. <laughs> yeah, just now. Yeah. So starting in Carneros and then going up to Calistoga, sure. and then there's like you know Yountville, like Oakville, Rutherford, et cetera, et cetera. Wow. But Okinola is one of the more southerly ones. Okay. And so in Napa, it's cooler in the south and warmer in the north. So as you go <laughs> further, so you start in Carneros, which is super close to. Um, San Pablo Bay, so you get a lot of a lot of fog influence. And then as you go further north towards Calistoga, it gets progressively hotter. So Calistoga oh. in the summertime will be like hot as hell, like 110 days. Uh, but where they are yeah. is is a little bit on the cooler side for sure. Okay, cool. I like how it smells, right? There's just like a little bit of of something floral going on there. I get kind of like mm -hmm. some 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 beeswax and just some like nice light fruit. Like I would never. Never guessed this was Napa. from this this from Napa blind. Like it kind of yeah. reminds me of some Oregon Chardonnays, even maybe not quite as like crisp and zippy on the nose, but but just like the lighter, yeah. little more delicate touch to it. Well, that and the oak usage as well. It's really dialed down. Totally. It's just a little bit like the buttered popcorn thing going on, but just like yeah. very light. Yeah. So no new oak on this line, and oh, right. they actually prevent malolactic fermentation. Really? Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe that's a style that would do well in Napa because I wouldn't have guessed either of those things are true too. Because when you taste no mallow, like stainless steel Chardonnay from Oregon, it's really ripping, right? Like it's just really like kind of a sharp zip to it, and that that's not so much going on here too. This still has like soft mouthfeel, right? Like, the alcohol in this is pretty low. Thirteen okay. five. Yeah. So for Napa, I mean, this is a warm area. You know, like we're not mm -hmm. in Oregon. Like in the summertime, mm -hmm. like this is a warm area. You're going to need your sunscreen. You're going to need shorts and flip flops. So to me, it's pretty impressive that they can keep the alcohol like that. Totally. On the palate, super lean. Yeah. You know, like a very, very nice acidity. So. Yeah, just good feeling to the acidity. It lasts a long time. I think the fruit lingers well on the palate too. Mm -hmm. Like kind of some apples, a little bit of like, uh, like those little light, the yellow plums, like the really little ones. I keep forgetting what the name. Maribel, is that them? I don't know. I think so. Anyway, but but like the. Yeah, just some nice light fruit flavors. Real delicate experience, right? It's really well put together, lingers well on the palate, stays clean all the way through. Good acidity. Yeah, it's really enjoyable to drink. I think a really versatile food line, like as a sommelier, mm -hmm. it's it's something that will go with a lot of different things, like seafood, you know, it'll go with, with lighter meat dishes. I mean, it's, it's, it's nice to drink on its own, like on a porch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a good way to start an evening yeah. off too, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's really, yeah, just some nice flavors without without ever getting too heavy. What's interesting to me, I should say, the Mathiasins, like this is actually pretty unusual, like their Chardonnay blend, but they're more well known for um, is their white blend, which is, um, they, Steve and Jill, they have a passion for Friuli and grape varietals. So what's actually kind of cool is you go out to their house and they've, the parts of the house that they bought, it came with old vine Merlot. And they're like, well, we don't really want to work with Merlot. So Steve, who's a viticulturist by trade, has, has slowly grafted it over to Rafosco, and Schio Patino. Wow. And they make a white wine that's a really fantastic blend of Sauvignon Blanc, Semillon, Friulano, uh, and Rabola Giallo. And so this is just Steve's thing that he's like, I really am into Friulano. Great. Cool. You know, like, so he's like, Friuli is his passion. And I, I personally really respect that when someone has something they go after and like they just go for it 100%. Totally. And I, and yeah, I and they get it. You know, yeah. They get it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and just especially as time goes by too, right? Then they really learn the fruit they're working with, and they end up coming up with something that's that's really unique and personal, yeah. right? And, and 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 yeah, it's like unlike anything else in the world, right? Like, so that's, that's something that's I would just want to share about California is that it's not all like I mean, we are having Chardonnay, which mm -hmm. is awesome, and we're gonna have another Chardonnay, but mm -hmm. there are so many people that are doing really unusual grape varietals mm -hmm. and really experimenting, and kind of like going out there and doing their own thing. And and you probably don't see a lot of it outside of the state, right? Like I was to say, like I, I don't hear. People around here talking about interesting stuff going on in California, with with very few exceptions. Like there's a couple of producers that come up and people talk about, but uh, right, the, the cliches I guess it became so big was that probably through the '80s, right? That you're still kind of people are trying to evolve out of that image, right? Yeah, I think the two biggest misconceptions are that California only does Chardonnay and Cabernet, and that it's really hot. Sure. And when people are like, "Oh, California is really hot," I'm like, "Well, have you been to San Francisco in the middle of the summer?" Because it's not hot. Mm -hmm. It's actually really cold. Mm -hmm. And if you like, if you know anything about the, ge the geography of California, is that the fog is like a huge influence. And so all of these regions, it's like they have some fog influence. Like, you know, you think of like the, the Pacific Ocean as like your icebox. And any area that can let in any fog mm -hmm. 
It's huge. It's like that's going to cool down your climate. It doesn't matter if you're in Mendocino. It doesn't matter if you're in. We see cool climate wines even from Santa Barbara, which is like halfway between San Francisco and Los Angeles. And so, like technically speaking, if you're inland, it's probably like 110 degrees. Sure. But if you're on the ocean, you've got some inlet from the fog, 75, 80 degrees maybe max during the day. Wow. Colder at night. Okay. Yeah. That that's that's cool to know, right? And, and I'm sure, right? There are a lot of people who. Are doing kind of their own small production wineries kind of out of these unique sites too that just haven't had the volume or exposure yeah. i guess for a lot of people yeah here about. but two things i would say is just like a it's not all like chardonnay and cabernet and yeah. b a lot of cold climates excellent we'll move on to i'll give a little rinse here but uh we can talk about the the second line okay what's this so this is a fela 2011 chardonnay from the sonoma coast of california um, Thala, originally the first three vintages were actually bottled as Jordan Thala, the husband and wife team. Um, husband, Aaron Jordan, his wife's last name is Thala, and um, that worked for them until another very large winery put the smack down and said, um, you can't use the name Jordan. So, Which one that was? I, I don't know. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. And they all just known as Thala. Uh -huh. um, so Sonoma Coast, I'm actually just going to like swirl this and just drink it. Yep, that's yep, that's how it works. Yeah. That's how it works. Uh, so Sonoma, very different styles from Mathiasen. I'm sorry. So what's interesting Terrible to me point. is Mathiasen comes from what you would consider a classic area for Chardonnay, made in a very kind of unclassic way. Fela from a much colder climate area, but made in a little bit more of a traditional way. All right. Um, a little bit of new oak. It's about 15% new oak, and there is malolactic fermentation here. Um, as Barnaby noticed when he also was drinking it. But it's definitely a creamier style, it's it's leasier, it's definitely meant to, to me invoke a little bit more of a Burgundian feel. Acidity is still really nice, but it's um it definitely has a little bit more of that that texture when you drink it. And maybe that's suggestion, but it seems like the leaves come through a bit on the nose too, right? It seems like you can kind of smell a little bit of that kind of like pie it's pretty crust. Pretty creamy too. Yeah. I mean to me it's like creme fraiche and like yogurt and sour cream and a little bit of that new barrel mm, smell which nice. I personally really I enjoy to me like new oak is a little bit like truffles you know it's a little bit is really nice you don't want to put your like white truffles on everything but a little bit it's decadent it's really voluptuous but in a little bit it's it's, it's really nice it can work and some fruit I think supports it and some fruit does it too it seems like uh, yeah, like I'll have I'll, I'll have different wines. Like some some they can have a lot of it. Some of it I you know outright like this is oaky wine, but it's delicious. And other ones if it if it yeah. fights with the fruit flavors or mm -hmm. yeah. right there's another structural elements to help it out. It can get get kind of ugly. But remember, and I should say uh, just as a region in California, Sonoma Coast is a massive ABA, and that's one of the big sure. controversies in California now is we need to make this a little bit smaller because Sonoma Coast. What do you think when you hear the word coast? Oh, interesting, right? Coast. Proximity to the sea, right? But actually, yeah. Sonoma Coast actually extends all the way inland to like Sebastopol, which, if you know anything about Northern California, it's actually pretty far inland. Hmm. And so there's like a group of wineries, they call themselves the True Sonoma Coast, which is. Sure. That's we're not, actually the people who right? the ocean. Right. And, and your climate is pretty different in those locations, yes. I'm sure, right? Yes. It could yeah. be like a 20 degree temperature wow. difference. Yeah, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely some of the richness coming through, and I'm getting just like a little bit of honey flavor mm -hmm. as well. But but everything still stays pretty light; like it never really gets mm -hmm. heavy. Wow, the acidity comes in really late. Yeah. It's kind of like setting into the kind of like the molars, like the back of my tongue. Yeah, cleaning things up a bit. But uh, but every, every everything stays pretty light. Still a pretty delicate touch, even though there's like that sense of richness. Definitely kind of in contrast to, to the previous wine. What's the alcohol totally. on that? Yeah. Look. Yeah, we'll find out. I can't taste it. It doesn't seem huge to me. I think 13 it's eight. Yeah, 13 wow. eight. So below 14. Yeah. Which for California, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, they definitely could push it. I think in California, like oh, up over four, 15 if you wanted to. Sure, yeah, if you want to roll one. Yeah. No, it's really good. I mean, uh, it's, it's creamy, it's, it's it's a little bit rich, but at the same time, it's it's uh, not heavy, not lit. It's, it's, yeah, it's nice. Yeah. So. A little bit of apple peels, I think. Kind of late too. But. Mm. To me, it's just it's it's a different it's a very different style of chardonnay. It's it's almost like comparing apples and oranges. Like I might start with this first course, you know, maybe with like a crudo or something, just like a really simple salad. 
Whereas the phthala is definitely more, it's it's more like game meats, you know, like, like you know what I mean? Like guinea it's head, more substantial. roast yeah. chicken. Oh, like, that sounds, it's yeah. a little more intense. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, this, this is what you do, right? I, yeah. like that, that's, I mean, I'm thinking that's like guinea cool. head and like roast chestnuts, a little yeah. bit of cream sauce, you know? Sure. The bison's first course. Or like, you know, I got your house and you don't have food ready yet, so you gave me the bison. Right, exactly. That's what I mean. Like, good way to start things out, right? It's like, like pleasant. Yeah. Alright, so the last wine is a Gewurztraminer. Yeah, I'm actually really excited about this because I don't. This is a winery that's really hot right now in California, and like, I've actually never really had the wines before today. Oh, here we go. Um, Alright. So, this is a winery called Forlorn Hope, and the winemaker is Matthew Warwick. And I just love the name of the winery because Forlorn Hope is, um, it's a military term. Really? Yeah, and it refers to when you're going into a big offensive, the first wave of soldiers you send out. Oh, God. Okay. You know? <laughs> so think like, yeah. think like, you know, like Normandy, like you're storming the beach. Your first, the first guys are going to drop and they're like, hey guys, like, just so you know, like you're going to be in the first wave. And you're Sorry, like, man. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so they basically say that you're gonna have really heavy casualties, but anyone who makes it through, like that like five percent, apparently you reap like enormous rewards and like the psychological reward is like massive. Wow. <laughs> Which I personally really love because you're like you're starting a small winery, you know, a small brand in yeah. the midst of like how many other small brands and there's a little bit like forlorn hope. Like are you gonna make it through? Sure, right? <laughs> sure, and especially yeah. like they're not going for the cliches again, right? You're making the worst meaner, right? That's definitely kind of putting yourself out there, right? Like that's, that's yeah. really taking that risk. And so this so. is a worst meaner from the Russian River Valley, which is actually a sub, well, it's an a, it's a sub ABA of Sonoma County. And the entirety of the Russian River Valley actually lies within the Sonoma Coast, which is another kind of controversial thing. Because the Russian River Valley is pretty far inland, so it's around like Sebastopol and the hills sort of like west of there. Mm -hmm. And then so you've kind of got like, Russian River Valley and the Sonoma Coast kind of like overlaps that and it goes all the way up to the ocean. Oh, it surrounds it? Yeah. Wow. So a lot of times if you're in the Russian River Valley, you actually have the option, like you could label your wines as Russian River Valley or Sonoma Coast. Oh, right. So I suppose people probably do that to differentiate the quality levels and things like that. A little too. bit to kind of like make a statement of like, I've heard some winemakers say, like the winemaker I was just working with for Harvest um, up in Mendocino said, well, I'll always label my wine Russian River Valley because that's the historic heart of what it is. Hmm. But you could label it Sonoma Coast if you want. But he's saying like this is actually a little bit further inland. But Gewurztraminer, Russian River Valley is typically Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. So it's a little bit unusual to see Gewurztraminer there. Sure. Um, and this is what he calls one of the rare creatures bottlings, which is cool. basically one barrel made. Okay. And, and a one-off. This is just one vintage, won't be made again. And you know, like, was the, was the Pinot Noir, like, uh, was, was the Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, did that come in, like, was that, was that like market-driven replanting, or was most of the, were most of the vineyards there planted originally that way? Um, planted originally that way. It's definitely a colder climate than Napa. Okay. But um, it's definitely like by far and away what most people, if you go to the Russian River of California, it is mostly Pinot Noir. Sure. A little bit of Chardonnay, so it's really unusual to see these other grape varietals. Cool. So so a good find by them and, and, and very yeah. cool for us to get a chance to taste it up here. And this is definitely like riper fruits. I've had a I've had a diverse Romina recently that was like way more like light, bright, and flowery, and like this mm -hmm. is much more on the riper side, kind of like, uh, kind of a, almost like edging towards blood orange, I don't think it's quite there, but like a dark, dark orange kind of scents coming off the nose, like pie crust, a little bit of cloves, like, uh... It's pretty intense, it you know? smells like apple cider to me, or like yeah. very apple -y cider, like, yeah, it's spiced apple cider, yeah. yeah, so... But in my experience as a sommelier, when people smell this kind of wine, they pick it up and they're like, Oh, that's gonna be sweet, huh? It smells. Right. It, it smells it smell like sweet. But like dessert wines I've had, can right? you smell sweet? So I've I've heard plenty of people saying you cannot no. smell sweet. Yeah. Sweet is a taste sensation. Yeah. It's not a smell. This is an aromatic wine, but on the palate, it's dry. No sweetness. It's totally dry. Yeah. It's, it's very dry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for people Absolutely. watching this, it's like to try to explain this. It's like explosively aromatic, right? Totally. Mm -hmm. And and most most people that watch it are kind of wine nerds to begin with, which has been <laughs> a, a strange development. But that's how it is. So they yeah they, they get it. Yeah. I mean, it's to me, it's like it's like lychee. I mean, that's a classic note, right? For sure. Yeah. Like lychees and roses, 
but it's spicy. It's like ginger and sandalwood and just like really, really heavily floral. But totally, it's not sweet at all. Like you pick it up and you're like, oh, it smells like a little bit like women's perfume, but totally, totally dry. And definitely getting like some of those like ripe peach flavors, but without the weight. Like when I get that in Riesling, a lot of times it comes with a little bit of RS, you know. And 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 I certainly like that. Yeah, if you're watching this, you know that I like that. Um, but the flavors are still full, and I think there's a, I think there's a risk sometimes too when people try and make wines like this totally dry. They can really easily become unbalanced or uh, or lose some of the really interesting flavors, and they're still yeah. totally intact here. Yeah, uh, which is cool and kind of kind of a sign of somebody who like really kind of has his. his you know, his mindset and kind of some familiarity with trying, what he's trying to yeah. do. Yeah. I, so. I mean, it's very typical to me of the varietal of Gewürztraminer. A little bit, in some ways, a little bit more difficult to pair with food because it's so expressive. Mm -hmm. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's really like kind of just super, super expressive. Whereas these, for me, are a little bit. The Chardonnay is always a more neutral grape, so you can kind of pair it with food a little bit more easily. Gewürztraminer is a little bit like, oh, like what am I going to eat with that? Because it's so like crazy, like in your face. Right. So I gotta like, what, what would you guys want with it? Salad. Salad with like a vinaigrette or something? Oh, or like fruit sure. in it? Fruit and salad? I would say like like creme brulee like with orange peel or something like that yeah. in it. Because it's like just a, that little touch of bitterness is definitely there. Kind of right like just a little yeah. lemon twist kind of sitting in the center of the palate along with the other flavors. When we first went, when this was just like freshly popped and we tasted it right away, I didn't like it very much. I was kind of nervous about how this was going to go on the show. Yeah, I wanted to say that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but but it's really been it's really been interesting to see how I like. So it's been open for maybe an hour now, um, and it's everything's just like a lot more integrated. Yeah. And uh, and I think and, I think it being a little warmer too is really helping it too. Yeah. yeah the really aromatic grape varietals for me, if it's like a Virginia, like Viognier. You know, we're talking about, I thought it reminds me a little bit of the Torontes from Argentina. Yeah. Definitely difficult to pair with food, but I think with me, with just like some fresh fruit even, or just like a really simple salad would be nice. Yeah. Like an aperitif kind of style. Yeah. But it's so, I mean, we taste it at the end because it's so explosive. It kind of almost like, you know, you need a little palate cleanser before you move into something more neutral like a Chardonnay. Right. And, and yeah, and like to do it this before this, I think would definitely kind of like. Yeah. Conflict a little bit. Yeah. Confuse things. It, would, it could be a little difficult, but. Uh, Man, a, a great look into some really unique and interesting wines from California um, that we never would have heard of. Yeah, and they're all really Otherwise, small brands. So, yes. You know, like I love coming up here to Oregon. It's like everything is kind of small, and like everyone thinks California is like huge and like factory and industrial. And like you know, like let's be honest, it still kind kind of is. Yeah, a lot, uh, but that's what you <laughs> see, right? That's the image. But that's kind of what yeah. it is too. Right, they've got different staffs and ten yeah. people to push that image, right? Yeah. But, yeah. But what's exciting is yeah. that, you know, it, it is a little bit like Oregon, that there are like individual people and like husband and wives and like really like young people just like, I just want to buy some grapes and make some really cool wine. Like that's actually happening down there as well. And we have cold climates. Yeah. And, that, and that's that's great. So so thanks for coming to talk about it too. Like it's really great to have somebody that has some familiarity with these some wines. Some great knowledge of it. provide yeah. some context. Um, let's, let's take advantage of So we're done with the wines. Anything else like you want to talk about just in the wine world at large, right? So you're doing harvest, you're going to be looking for a new job next, like, what's what's your favorite wine region? If you could go spend a month just chilling out in one wine region in the world, which one would you go to? I mean, to be honest, like, I, I, and I'm not just, like, being trite, like, I'm no, really excited about what's happening, like, locally. Totally. So you, you would just chill out and, yeah, and spend like, time with wineries in California. That's totally To be right. honest, like, so, to give you, like, my, like, five-second, like, background, yeah, like, I it. used to live in New York, and I was a typical, like, New York song, which mm -hmm. means that you only drink European wines, like, French, mm -hmm. Italian, maybe a little bit of Spanish if you're feeling adventurous, and you think, like, domestic is crap. Sure. Wow. Okay. You don't drink that That's at all. That's sad. And then, when I, I went to Australia, and all of my song friends in New York said, oh, well, that sounds like fun, except you're going to have to drink a lot of Australian wine. And I was like, oh, like, yeah, that's going to suck. And then I got to Australia, and I was like, yeah, you know what? Like, a lot of this wine is total shit. It's like, it's really ripe, it's really alcoholic, it's really gross. And then I started kind of getting more into it. It's like, you know what? There's a lot of really good wine here. Mm -hmm. A lot of really small producers and people that are just, like, doing their own thing. And, like, I'm a little bit embarrassed that I came here thinking that it was all going to be Yellowtail, because it's not. And so when I came to California, because I'm not, I'm, a, I'm an East Coast. Sure, yeah. When I came to big California, change, yeah. yeah, big change. Two years ago, I kind of took that same attitude of like, well, most California wine is probably like not very good, which like, not very good. Sure. But there's that little subset. It's like really exciting, you know. And I think that if you, 
get excited by like farmers markets and like and local foods and just just like knowing who your neighbors are like you know why go to France like why go to Italy when you can just like meet your neighbors and you can be really cool people like Steve and Jill that are doing something really exciting and making something delicious and like yeah I could go to Burgundy and and learn from something from someone amazing but I could also like go hang out with Steve and Jill and like eat barbecue in their backyard did you hear that, Stephen Jill? You are as cool as drinking <laughs> wine in Burgundy. <laughs> that was probably the best answer we could have had to that question. Yeah. So thanks so much for throwing that all out there. Um, and and, and I'm not sponsored by the California Wine Market. To totally not. No, this is totally totally a social event. So 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 we'll kind of in that spirit, I got to put you on the spot one more time. Guests have to ask a question of the audience. We might get all the way up to three or four comments in response <laughs> with our, our massive internet fame. But, uh, but, but yeah, is there anything you'd like to know from people who watch the show? And it can be about wine, it can be about weather, it can be about baseball, if you're into that sort of thing. We're not so much. But, uh, but go ahead and ask. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I guess I'm thinking about wine right now. Like, Run with it. Yeah. Why do you drink wine? Why do you like wine? That's a good question. Man, Why do you collect wine? And if you're watching this show, like we know by now, we know who most of you are. You care about wine. It's not a trivial one-off thing. Do you for believe you. me that California wine is not all shit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh, yeah. That's, that's it. That's that one might get some answers. We'll even do the double. Well, oh, even better. Do you believe me that all, not all Australian wine is shitty? <laughs> Triple. All kinds of all right. questions. Come back answer with some something. answers. We'd love to hear it. Um, show some love for the guests we have on to do interviews with us because it's it's great of you to spend the time doing it. So thank you. Thanks Great. a lot, and, thank and hopefully we cross paths again in the future. I hope so. Cheers. Bye, guys. Bye.